we sometimes we include don't worry we, I, I actually do that I actually I yeah. don't have a problem with that like yeah. I think I actually think it's the best way to leave. makes it more real I I'll think. give you one bit of advice whenever you're doing an interview with someone like keep the recorder running from the very start yeah, to the very, very that's first. what we, we do we actually we have a funny story about that we were interviewing Eileen Dunn yeah, yeah, yeah. we were going to interview David McCullough later in the evening yeah okay and we said to Eileen um, anything you can tell us about David and she was like oh we slept together once and this is after the interview. Just like brilliant. Pure after after the interview. Like, and yeah. I had stopped recording on my phone, but Greg had let the iPad um, keep going. And so we actually caught it. And we were like, oh, we might have a bit of fun with this. I don't think she realised that we were still recording. If that was me now, I'd be mixing that down into a dance track. So we'd, oh, we slept together. <laughs> oh, we slept together. I don't think we're that skilled at it. Um, <laughs> but I emailed Send it over her. to me. I'll mix it down for you. I'll send it back to you. I you take credit for it, though. <laughs> um, I emailed her and was like, do you mind if we use this as promotion for your episode? Just say that like that you were you slept with him. And he just was like, yeah, go for it. I mean, it was for sure, focus. Fair play. Do you know what? She it, is just sound. Oh, like, yeah, yeah. Good crack, yeah. She like, just yeah. sound. And when we, when we brought you with David, David was just like... Yeah, he's like, yeah, I'm proud of it. Yeah, what? Together, yeah. And what? See, see this mic here? See this? Mm -hmm. It's a Neumann. So you see that little dot there? Talk uh -huh. right in there or okay. else you're going to be off mic. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I just said a point. That no, no, I, was, no, no, I want to get your best yeah. audio that you can get. Okay, um, that's deadly. But anyway, as I say to you, so some of the best interviews I've done, literally like I've left it on from the start and I've had the phone recording and the Zoom recorder, whatever the mics and whatever. And my finish up time, that's it, now we're done. And I still have a recording. I'm like, so listen you're capping off with everything whatever that quote is whatever happens after is like yeah man thanks like whatever whatever they say or whatever sometimes that can be your best opening yeah. quote mm -hmm. so you can start with that ambiguous quote play a track and then the next thing move into your interview and I always think that that's one of the things that a great interviewer does like it not that I, I'm not, <laughs> but it's just I picked that up from great interviewers. You know what I mean? But yeah. anyway, no, so no. let's fire ahead. Hundred percent agree. Right, Gav, go on, bring us in. Welcome back to In Conversation with. You're listening to myself, Gavin, Colm, and Greg. How you doing? Well, and it's a big day for us. Yeah, boys are on our holidays. Yeah, we're on tour again. Another new location. We've done we've done some great locations now, but this is definitely up there. Where for are we them. today, lads? Go, go on, in, Gavin. Tell us. Go on, tell us. We there. were in Marconi House. Marconi House, home in of today many FM. different radio many, yeah. stations, but the one that's in question today is Today FM. We're in the Today FM studios, joined by Mr. Fergal Darcy. It's all right, it's all right, mm. man. All right, it's all right, it's all right, it's all right, it's Thanks very much, Fergal. Now, listen, thanks a million for, uh, for bringing me on your In Conversation with podcast, which is brilliant, by the way, boys. Uh, fair play. Thanks Great work. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. It is lovely to have you up here because sometimes I think like when I see guys like you who are enthusiastic, this is where you're probably going to end up working anyway. So, 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 so in a couple of years' time, <laughs> so in a couple so. years' time, you'll be doing in conversation, which you're like, oh, here again, oh, <laughs> oh the hanging gardens of Marconi, yeah. uh, where men are men or sheep and nervous. Uh, right. Well, we're bright eyed yeah. and bushy tailed today, anyway. Still, <laughs> still. Well, start, I keep it that way then for a while. Star struck. Um, yes. Yeah, so I'll start it as I always do, and. It was a while ago that I first emailed you and unfortunately schedules kind of got in the way so we didn't get to sit down until now. But what was the initial thought when I approached you to, to be on the podcast? I'm, I'm very excited about this actually, to be honest with you. Uh, do you know what the funny thing is? I've had a, a really busy couple of months and it has, it has it's, it's been nearly six months, hasn't it? Since yeah, we were chatting good, first. good while. Um, I know it was in around the start of the summer, but the funny thing is, is that you can get very busy, particularly with the stuff I do because I'm mostly music based. So there's a lot of festivals on the summer. There's a lot of interviews. People are taking their holidays. You have to do a lot of cover. There's a lot of going to gigs and there's a lot of kind of doing out broadcasts as well. So that can get fairly raggle taggle. Um, but my initial thought when you got in contact was, first of all, very humble to be asked uh, because I do think that I, I still regard myself as kind of on the younger end of the spectrum, but I know that at this stage of the game, I've probably been in it for about 15 years now, so I, I don't really get to take that mantle RT, anymore. you'd still be considered a baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the nappy's still yeah. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. Oh, there he is now, the young lad, causing all the ruckus. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's actually, it, it's funny, because like, I, I kind of realise now, you know, I'm 36 now, I'm not the, the bright and bushy-tailed 22, 23-year-old that I was when I started off. Uh, still have that mentality, mind you. <laughs> but it is, you know, I've learned a lot over the years and I, I think that, I, I think one of the most exciting things you can do is something new and take yourself out of the comfort zone. And when you get out of the kind of the format of a show and you get to do more exciting things like podcasts and talk to people about the stuff you do, it is exciting and it's nice to share that knowledge because I was lucky enough when I was coming up that I got to meet a lot of people uh, who were very nice to me, who were my peers, who shared a lot of knowledge with me and taught me a lot of tricks. And I think that that's kind of where you're at in the industry. If you can't, you know, help the next generation up, then you're wasting your time, really, in yeah. this game. You are, like. I think one of your colleagues, Ian Dempsey, said, uh, you, you have to be nice to everyone in, the, in this industry because you never know who's going to be your boss one day. Yeah. Yeah, so true. Like, And the funny thing is, is that can happen overnight, and I've, I've definitely noticed this in radio over the past few years, is... Oh, 
I'll give you I'll give you an example. I know a girl who came onto a promo team in a station I worked with years ago. She was a hairdresser. She didn't really like the job on the promo team. Worked just into marketing, and now she's one of the head marketing people in the country. And that all happened in a very short space of time. But she was diligent. and She wanted it. And I mean, if you have that that vigor behind you and you're self motivated, because it is at the end of the day, the only person that will motivate you is yourself. Literally you will go a long way. I know, I have to give these two a kick up the arse every now and then. Oh, no. Uh, do you really <laughs> want to get into this? <laughs> to live the, up during our podcast. In fairness, Colin, to be honest, would you look at the size of those two arses, that's a lot of kicking. <laughs> You're not wrong, for I'm on the knees every now and then. Um, so, we'll get into what you've been uh, doing recently uh, later on, but uh, we'll take you back to the very start. So, so as a young lad growing up in Ballinus Low out west in, in County in Galway. In the wild west, yeah. In the wild, wild west. Do you was, know what's amazing? I, uh, yeah, I, I could have seen it coming down the line. I know that I know that when I was in secondary school I was mad into doing like the college magazine and things like that. I was always interested and intrigued by that kind of stuff. Um, but even when I was younger, we listened to a lot of radio. Uh, we, we met a lot of mixtapes, you know, waiting for Larry Gogan to shut up and just kind of, you know, <laughs> hold, hold, down, hold down the record button and go, oh, and hi to respect to Larry. Like, we would literally be listening in the afternoon just waiting to get the song that you wanted or listening to Long Wave Radio, Atlantic 252. And all the hits that come on every half hour. <laughs> That's how high the rotation was. An awful, 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 awful signal where I was living from Mornington House. Uh, but yeah, we would record the songs. Earlier. I suppose all the telltale signs were there that I was going to get into media, but I didn't read into it. And when I went to do my leaving cert, I know that my first choices were law and um, medicine. And oh, wow. my oh, wow. fifth choice was journalism. And I was offered my fifth choice. I came out with 495 uh, after the weekend, that still, yeah. that's it was alright. Like, like, I, 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 I was a you swat. Went to, you went to Yates, didn't you? Uh, I went to Yates. Yeah, I was yeah. a bit of a swat, and I've no problem. I'm no no point in not admitting it. I always was a bit of a nerd, um, and I was big into rugby as well. So I left Garbley uh, because well, there was two reasons. Number one, I found I was involved in the debating team, and I was involved in the rugby team, and I kind of thought that look, I need to step away from that in order to to really focus on the Leaving Cert. And my sister had went there, and I thought it was a good option at the time, and it was, and I, I don't regret it. It was a fine school. And I still have a lot of time for the staff there and I keep in touch with them. But when I came out with 45, I, I like from my mocks, I got 425 and I was kind of going, what's going on here? And um, and I, like I kind of ended up with my fi- fifth, cho- fifth choice on CAO, but I, I got offered uh, the corporate law afterwards, but I, I stuck with the journalism because I knew it was kind of where I was going to end up. And to be honest with you guys, doing journalism for the first time in DIT, I didn't realise it was going to be so print intensive. Everton. This is where we're coming to, yeah. Because like um, this, 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 this strikes my head. I was the editor of the GIT Independent for two years. I was printed out of it by third year. As in, as far as I was concerned, I didn't come to college to learn how to write an article in a, in a paper. I, I wanted to be like you know. And tonight in Washington, George Bush has <laughs> made a very important speech. Over to you, bank and studio. I, I, like to me, I was thinking, this is it. I was thinking, yeah. I'm going to be up there reporting on reporting, these serious yeah. stories. And I was thinking of Charlie Bird, like you know, all the crime reporting today, tonight, back in the day, him sticking his head in the side of a car. But I don't know as much change there. Well, see, I. This was what we laughed at as we came into the studio. I did journalism in DIT for all of about three days. Yeah. And I dropped out because um, I realised instantly it was incredibly print-based. Now, you did yours in, I think, 2002? 2002, I went in there. Now, can I just say this? Mm. I, I do think like there's a lot of gratitude I have for that because I think I could have learned it all in a year, mm-hmm. as in what to do with print and how to write an article, the inverted pyramid, all that kind of stuff. And it's, you know, to go highbrow, Gutenberg to the press, all those kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, the, you know, the Sock and Paul side, because it was an artist degree at the end of it all. But I, I do think that, you know, everything there, you know, wasn't taken for granted. It was important, but I do think it was too intensive on that because anyone will tell you now, lads, it's working in media and even back in 2002 to 2005 if you were working for a media platform whether it be television radio a blog or a newspaper you have to have an online aspect of podcasts video print it's all relevant so you did everything you learned it didn't go to waste and I think that when I got to the third year and they asked us you know what do you want to major and I remember thinking to myself well look radio's here it's an option and I've always been keen on radio but it was documentary making and I was just fascinated by that idea of making a documentary and there was words like soundscape that would be thrown around the room and I remember thinking of, um, you'll hear this fo- Foley sound effects and how that happens is back in the day when they were making radio, they didn't have really recorders to make it so if they wanted a seal walking across the, do- the floor, they'd get two marigold gloves and fill them up with water and go <laughs> 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 like, but this is it, like that, that, that's what they did, you know, like, like this kind of, they would make those kind of noises and that would be the substitute sound effect. But here's the thing. At the time, I was just fascinated by the whole idea of soundscape and what's going on in the background and where you can get a good interview. So, for instance, if you guys didn't have a studio to meet me today or I didn't have a studio, I would say, right, boys, how do you fancy going over to the car park and sitting in my car? And you probably go, 
um, that's a bit weird of Fergal to <laughs> Well, that. actually, of, uh, yeah. one of our interviews was with Rick O'Shea, obviously legend of TFM yeah. and now Gold. Great guy. And we, he came up and we didn't have a room booked. We usually try and uh, get a we room. We were double in, booked. We were double we booked, were double booked uh, in one of the rooms in the student centre in DCU. And we were brainstorming, brainstorming. And then, then I think I turned to Laz and said, will we ask him who... Uh, does he mind doing it in Shannon Square? One of the student apartments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not even our apartments. Not our student apartments. Yeah. Our mates. I literally texted one of my mates and was like, do you mind if we do our interview uh, in your apartment, in your sitting room? Because we've been double booked and we have nowhere else to do it. And Ricochet is like right here now. And she was like, yeah, give me like five minutes to clean. Clean the apartment. We came in, yeah. made coffee, sat down on the couches and did the interview for an hour. It was probably one of our favourite like yeah. settings. Our, certainly. In, in terms of con- like conversation. We had a great actual, time with him. Yeah. yeah. The more anxiety you have before an interview, I, and this is like you're, it gets your adrenaline up and running it makes you think quicker it does and genuinely and you know that's the people that are going to make it in radio it's yeah. the people that have this attitude of there is always a way and the one thing I'd say you could do worse than a, than a car though and the reason why I think about it is you just think about the interior of a car like it is made of basically all material it's felt mm-hmm. it's the perfect sound booth yeah. Um, and like literally that's why I would always say like you know I, I, like there's been several uh, interviews I've done with artists like where I've kind of went look this room is a bit too reverb all, all this I never like do you mind if we go down there oh yeah no problem yeah, let's do that. and it works and it works similarly you interviewed Ricochet back in the day I was making a, a documentary about Atlantic 252 I met Ricochet in Stevens Green and we sat down beside each other all the birds are singing outside it's, yeah. and it sounds beautiful it sounds wonderful yeah. it's just that, that that was the idea to me a soundscape and I think that's what got me into the documentary making I'll just take that on for you very quickly I managed to win a student media award. Just media, yeah, you yeah. won a media. I won a SME media award. I think it must be in 2005 and it was for news and current affairs. So like, people know me for music and entertainment, but like this was for news and current affairs back in the day and it was for a documentary I made about schizophrenia and it was called uh, Can You Hear Me Thinking? I felt very lucky for it. And like, guys, I'll be honest with you, this will show you how surreal life can be is that, you know, two, three, you know, even five years ago, we, the talk to us would always have been like, God, if you're a student and you win a media, imagine how big that'd be. It was such a big thing because we went so many years, second year, third year, when I was doing the we, newspaper. We've gone ourselves yeah. as well. And you never, like in fairness, you get bronzes and you get silvers, you never win, right? But I remember the year I won thinking, God, that, that was just the most amazing feeling in the world. And do you want to know the, the funny thing about it is I ended up presenting it last year, which to me was kind of going, how does that even happen? Like, <laughs> how does it even happen? Like, but it just, it's, it's mad because they were saying um, to me that, you know, the first, one of the first ones who was ever won one and actually ended up presenting, which I thought was pretty mad, but it, that, that's how it goes. You'd imagine like. it's a national or natural kind of progression. That, life. You know. Do you know, I find a lot of ca- a talent coming out of there. Uh, and, and I think that that's one thing that students need to realise. Some people just think, oh, sure, that's only fair, so I'm not going to get involved in that. I mean, like, I don't need a stinking award to make me grateful. Like, in fairness, like, the thing is, is that, look, if you have it at your back, it's just another accolade that you can use. And people do notice that in your CV. Because mm-hmm. I remember your CV, at best, can only look to be about one and a half pages long, if even. Yeah. Uh, if it's, if it, and if it looks busy at one and a half pages, you've done something wrong. I think... Uh in DCU, uh, the Media Production Society do the hybrid awards every year and people can submit their work from throughout the year. And we did submit our, um, our what was a radio show, we're obviously now a podcast. And we were actually fairly confident going into it that we, we had a good chance of win. We didn't. And I think it actually put a bit of a chip on our shoulder and actually drove us on to, yeah, to really... To um, really um, I think, I think we were probably it. rest on our laurels a bit. Like we were after getting a couple of good guests and yeah. probably were getting a small bit complacent. And then when we didn't get it yeah. we were just kind of like we were, we were initially angry and, but at the same time it's, it certainly drove us on and it was, it was fair and for, like our if we listen back to our demo now I think that we submitted I think we'll cringe because it was actually yeah. pretty, compared to uh, pretty yeah. poorly put together whereas this time now we're coming back with another year's experience and obviously a great line of guests so and we we got, uh, can I just say this to you that is, that is if you have that attitude you're going to go places like straight yeah. out guys I cannot even lie about that I listen to radio that I, I have prank calls that I did 10 years ago <laughs> people play me going, oh my god, it was down in care there in the junior B changing room. And I heard this uh, prank call, you heard it, I went, yeah, that's one of mine from back in the Iran. <laughs> and they're kind of going, God, you wouldn't get away with it now. But if you can take the time to go back and actually look at your work and go, God, I could make that sound so much better, you've learned because there's nothing worse than actually listening back to your own. I hate that, yeah, you so know what I mean. And there so isn't any percent we did at the start of this year was uh, when we all got back to college, we kind of did like, right, lads, let's look at the show, what's working, what's not, uh, what can we do. To change it. We, ha- yeah. up roles? we had to be honest with ourselves and say, look, as much as one of us might like this segment, it doesn't work for the overall mm-hmm. uh, flow of the show, so we have mm-hmm. to get rid of it. And like listening back to one of our first interviews, like we started interviewing our mates and listening back to them now, they are awful. They're, <laughs> so, they're so crack. They're, like, they're, yeah. they're, they're not. crack, but so, like, and some of the segments were clever, but so, like, it, they were pretty poor. Yeah. And compared to what we do now, we do have 
uh, not a structure, let's say, but we do have a set of kind of guidelines for ourselves about how to direct. We like to see yeah. where the conversation will take itself naturally. Yeah. I, I think that's important, but I also think it's important to be prepped a little bit. Yeah. I do think, and I can say this from from talking to the three, it's it's obviously more difficult to interview when there's three of you in it. But I think you've you've handled it quite well so far. So, by all means, you I I, I noticed by you that this is something that's you know you're you're pretty passionate about and and you get on with. Don't worry, this this takes time. Like you don't master this overnight. Like particularly when it comes to interviews. Like I've had screamers of interviews that I just kind of looked at and went, oh my god, how am I going to edit that to make this sound right? <laughs> and then there's other ones where like literally they've just been so easy to talk to. It's just, it it all depends on the guest and how you manage like, with yeah. Yeah. Um, so the first uh, port of call for your radio career was Clear FM. Yes, yeah, yeah. So after uh, after the whole um, media thing and all that, straight away I sent out CVs, and this is before we'd even got our results uh, in. And the only one that really got back to me was, was Clear FM. Now I think when I was in first year of college, I'd auditioned for the Den job and I'd gone into the last fifteen. But straight away on the CV, they saw that and they saw the award, and they went, "Okay, this is a bit of talent that we could be grooming here for ourselves for the future." Um, so I went down and started working at Clare FM there's an absolutely wonderful gentleman in the radio industry if you ever get a chance he'd be worthwhile talking to Lee Moshe worked with Mike Murphy back in the day he's with Temp FM at Clare FM he's done so much for Irish radio from his RT days to what he does now he's just a, a personal hero of mine who, who championed me from the start and I, I, you know I meet him every year at the radio awards and I, I just I think that it's people like him that made me want to stay in this game from the start but when I got in um, I ended up on breakfast with a gentleman and needless to say like I'm just out of college and I just got a job there and the first day I ever met him the first thing he ever said to me was yeah well <laughs> you know I don't, I, I don't know about this like you know I've never worked with anyone else before so like you know you might not even have a job at the end of the week <laughs> and he just went on his merry way his jolly way walking like Mr. Soft down the street and, and I remember just sitting there going who is this guy and like I, I, I'd never met him I knew that he was um, big in, 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 in the area he was working in, but I don't think he realised at the time, and I don't know if he meant any Mr. Mining by it, but what I do know is that he had said the wrong thing to me at that very moment in time because it kind of sent me into a bit of a bout of depression and I just felt like I was starting off on the wrong foot. And I always felt that like he was never going to let me have any involvement in that show. Mm-hmm. And uh, without any disrespect, that's just how my I am I am impersonated. Literally, I was, he saw me more of as an assistant as a co-contributor. Like that's that to him. That's what I was. I was just the you assistant. Equal, and such, and like. in fairness, like I'd sit down the court of law with him, and he and he could say what he wants, but it's the truth. Like literally, I spent most of my mornings when I was working breakfast answering phones instead of being on air, which is what I was hired to do. Now, literally, a while after that, I think they kind of went, "Well, look, that's not really working. So we'll just leave him do his own thing, and what we'll do is we'll give him his own show." So I ended up uh, doing the weekend slot, uh, the big weekend slot, which would have been from two to six or whatever you have Saturday and Sunday. I ended up being their agricultural editor. Yeah, farm this focus, is farm, like this is this is a fact. This is a fact, and I did that show quite successfully for two years. What's your agricultural background like, Ferg? I'm from Ballinasloe, uh, home still of the biggest the- horse fair in Europe. Still the home of the biggest horse fair in Europe. Yeah. <laughs> I tell you, there's more bullshit in that town than. <laughs> uh, but you know, I, I got to be honest with you. My family did have like a kind of a roar background. Not my personal, like as in my my mom and dad. But my mom would have came. Her people would be farmers. Uh, but I knew quite a bit about it. And the thing is, gentlemen, being a journalist, I am quite an expert on pretending to be an expert about things that I know absolutely <laughs> fuck all about. Uh, that is the true trick to being a journalist uh, in this world. Greg, yeah. yeah. Greg, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I, right, I maintain right. that, uh, actually, I, sh- geez, I should not say this on air, um, quite a few of my, of my, my articles are quite fictional. Yeah. That's not a good way to start in journalism. I think. Uh, you... No, no. Um, well, this... start. start uh... See, no, I, I, I work for a regional newspaper, and uh, I will, as as well as going to matches, occasionally I have to do roundups. Whereas I have to cover maybe seven matches that took place, and I'm not paid to go to them. Okay, this we definitely have to cut this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I right. basically have to ring around and ask people, "Hey, come here. What happened?" And they're like, "Oh, I wasn't there." Oh, no, that's fair. That, okay, you're giving an account of the match though, and you've got it from a reliable source, so that's fair enough. Reliable is probably questionable. Pushing it. Yeah, mm. yeah. So a lot of the time, like, I remember one time this guy, he was a friend of mine, he just completely ripped the piss out of me, and he gave me five names. These were the top five scorers for the team. Five of them were in Australia. They'd moved out like six months prior. And not a word was said though, you know, <laughs> printed in the paper, not a word said. Everyone got a laugh out of it. Yeah, I think you need to be... Um, and cut. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you get any trouble over that, but I, like, I will be honest with you. Look, your job is to be like, you know, pretend to be an expert about things you know absolutely nothing about. And that's a friend of mine who's become a mysterious advisor since then and did journalism with me. It's the person who told me that and I've always believed that he was right and I don't think anything has changed. Like literally, even when you go in to interview someone, you do your research and make sure you know what you're doing and then you go from there. But with the farm a folks program 
that agricultural editor job. I actually really enjoy that because I got to speak to Norman people on the ground and they were actually disappointed when I left. And what happened was is that shortly after... Um, I was in Clare FM and they, they'd taken me off air and I was just doing producer on an afternoon show. And I was doing three or four shows at one stage. We then to go to this just not talking on air at all. And I knew it wasn't what I wanted. Literally, uh, about two weeks after that, I got a phone call from a gentleman saying that they're starting up this new station in the west of Ireland called I-105. They were wondering if I was interested in going to it. And I was like, I-105, okay. So I went down and I met them and I was making 32 grand at the time. And I remember I settled for 28 grand after three rounds of interviews because uh, they had come after me at three rounds of interviews and I took the job at 28 grand and the station hadn't even launched yet. And they, just, they changed the name to 102-104, I-102-104. And we went on air in February 2008. Now, I'm going to tell you something. When I left Clare FM, I was really dubious and down about where I was going to go with my life. Um, radio wasn't working out for me. I, I kind of felt that, like, having started off and cut my teeth, whilst I will say this, cutting your teeth in the local radio station is highly advisable because that is where you will learn to to meet all the barriers come up against it you have to do all the jobs yourself there's no research there's no producers you got to do all the jobs yourself you got to learn to handle yourself you got to learn how to be good and how to be you know good at what you do but you, you will really learn from grassroots how to do things that's local radio I did take the scenic route so I went local, regional, to national where I am now when I left, I was kind of thinking, you know, I've learned a lot, but it's in the industry I want to work in. And it was tough at the time. It was tough because you had a lot of people around you who had been involved in local radio for a while in a couple of local stations around the place, not just where I was based on, but I could see it happen around the place that there was these local characters who never wanted to leave that job. As far as they were concerned, they were the biggest things since sliced bread and nobody's going to take them off the pedestal. That was it. That was the way radio was when I started. And unfortunately, I think that's, and now fortunately it has gone out, but it was that way. And I just, I met a lot of people who I didn't really get on with. Um, I met a lot of people who were brilliant as well, like Liam and the guys, it's, so I, I cannot praise them enough. And another gentleman called Brian Flynn, who taught me pretty much a lot of the stuff I know about radio. And he was very good to me. But I remember at the period I, I went back and I was doing, because it was in the summer and I was doing Scribe for the Leaving Cert and I had done some teaching as well uh, in a local society, an art screen. You can do that. You can do sub-teaching just to get money, kind of keep going, keep flow going. And then uh, we went into I radio. And that launched in February and I, I was working with a guy called Peter Galley and straight away my love and my vigour for radio just came back. And that to me was probably the most precarious part of my whole career it was from 2007, 2008 because I thought I was shit. And I thought in my head I had been told by people that I was shit and that I'd never make it. And I, kind of, I, thought, I thought that like, you know, I'll never get over this now. Because uh, I'd taken a few knocks and I'd taken a few knocks in my life as a whole and I kind of didn't... I'd always, you know, dusted myself off and got up, but like I did this time around, I kind of thought, I don't have any time to waste. You know, I'm in my 20s. I can either go back and do a master's or something else, which would be probably the best thing to do, or I can give this career a shot. But I met this wonderful gentleman called Peter Ganley. We started off and we're on something special. He, 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 his thought process was the same as me. We were avant-garde. Like, you know, we were reinventing things. We were creating characters. We were doing prank calls. We were doing stuff with production that nobody else had done. And like literally in 2008, in October, we win the PPI award for best lighthearted entertainment program. This is 2008, like, and the two of us are there and we're the best show in the country. And it's the first time ever since Ray Darcy, our hero, uh, the guy, one of the guys who we listened to, who was kind of, you know, avant-garde as well in his style of radio. It was the first time he had been bet. He had won that on the trot. It was Sean Moncrief won it the first year ever. Then he had won it on the trot. And then we were the first people to come in. And he won it the following year again. But the fact that we could come in there as two new guys on a brand new station and do that, for us, we knew that this was us. And we're going to stick with it. And uh, that was a big, that was a big moment for me because that was, that was, that was the one time that, you know, I realised that, you know, all your dreams can come true if you have the courage to pursue them. Like and that, you stick that, with them, yeah. And I stick with that. I stick with that all my life. Like, and I've always said that if you can dream it, you can do it. Like, and I think that's when I see kind of guys like you coming in to do this kind of stuff, I'm kind of going, no, always be encouraging, always be telling people because like, there's any amount of fuckers out there that'll knock you. And that's great. Do you know what you'll do? Write down their name on a piece of paper, turn it into a flying fuck, and fly it out the way of your eyes again. <laughs> Make it into a pair of bear and call it a fire, and throw it out the window. Because it's going to do you no, be- no good. Like, it's taking up rent in your head, it's not sp- uh, paying any. It's taking up space in your head, it's not paying any rent, is what I meant to say. So, you were at iRadio um, for about seven years till 2015? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, the interesting time in iRadio, so we went through a lot there, and that was nuts. So, it went from me and Ganny working together, you know, best of mates, and we were in the middle of a recession guys mm. and uh, there had to be redundancies mm. and there were shows cut and people moved and I remember 
one of the cuts they had made was they had got rid of our breakfast show, moved Dave O'Connor down to breakfast and moved Peter uh, to iTalk along with Mary McGill, which means they'd split up our team. Mm-hmm. And at the time I fought it, I kind of went, well, look, you know, we're, we're an award-winning team. This is not... This is a bad idea. And I suppose you can't just replicate that that dynamic no, 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 as you well. Like, you know. I'm telling you, I've worked with a hundred people since, and you definitely cannot. Like what it's Peter something and I, I had, have. It's no, it was special. Like, yeah. It was special. Like, and I'll tell you how special it was. Is that on my final night in iRadio, I didn't. iRadio didn't bring me out in the night out with the staff like or anything like that. Literally, I hopped in my car, I drove to Galway, and met with Peter. And I, I'd, I'd only worked for Peter for two years that that period. I worked on my own for eight years we'll say well sorry six six years in around after that so like literally but he was the first person I met and we still remain very close friends and we will always be very close friends um, but it's just we ended up in that situation which is unfortunate that to get split up but like you know I had quite a successful period there on iRadio and you know it was a regional station originally it was it was I-102 and a four cover in seven or eight counties then it turned into iRadio the full northeast and northwest 15 counties and in that zone I had 120,000 listeners out of 15 re- fifteen sorry rural counties what would be regarded as basically yeah, yeah, rural yeah, counties yeah. you're in a national station now and you have got 26 counties to play with and I'm I'm nowhere near well I'm I'm a couple of thousand below what I was on my radio and that was with 15 counties because it's a very different show it's a very different show like it's not the magazine show I used to do I would never get the big interviews they would always go to breakfast on the regional station because they wouldn't have as many interviews um, so they have to kind of shove them down the way so that you know you breakfast, you win breakfast you win the day that's the mentality and that, I, I agree with that the world over but then with my show I, I, I kind of I, I would use very basic ways using universal themes, things that appeal to everyone. Like, So I wouldn't be on talking about all oh, the latest Assassin's Creed because that only caters to 20% of the people. But you go on and you talk about somebody using a can of Guinness uh, to defrost... Uh, yeah, yeah. No, no, but to defrost their, their windscreen, you're kind of going, number one, what tick? What tick? <laughs> uh, number two, right, straight away you've grabbed people's attention. And number three, you're into the universal theme of talking about things that you have an alternative use for. And everyone will talk to you about that. Assassin's Creed, not so much like. So you've catered for 80% of the people. That's catered for the majority. That's real. That was my mentality the whole way up through with some clever features. And it got me the listeners. And I love that. And uh, I think it was kind of a, it was the same situation very much so as leaving Claire FM uh, to iRadio. It's what it was with coming here. It was like kind of phone call. Would you be interested? Will you come up and meet? Will you meet again? Will you send on a demo? Phone call. Would you like to sign a contract? And that's kind of how it happened. And that's what brings us into kind of this current period, uh, but which has kind of been... And what was that moment like? You're moving... Like, obviously, you'd built up quite a reputation down um, with iRadio. And you you were starting to become more prominent in the media industry. It was, yeah, it was it was, it was, but it was I growing, suppose the but it wasn't... to Today FM, like, is... It was very strange. Uh, like, I'd have to be very honest with you guys. I own a house in Galway, uh, just outside of Galway, Banslow. And, you know, it's a five-bedroom house. It's a modest house. I bought it when the bubble burst and I got it at a really good price. Mm-hmm. And I was making an I radio roughly about 40 grand a year. Now, once you go over 33 grand a year, pretty much that next seven grand. It's tax. Yeah, it's tax. And you might see 1,500 of that, right? So basically, yeah, that's what you're making. And then whatever your niches are, your bit of DJing that you're doing, and then you're paying a bit off that as well. But I was living quite comfortably and happy down in Galway with that. And I had a good career with I radio. Um, when I moved up to Dublin, I realised that it becomes a very different lifestyle because you become a contractor, the cost of living, multiply it by four from what it was where I was living in the Midlands. Uh, you don't have your own house anymore with your five bedrooms and walk around your duvet in the nip and play a PlayStation. No, that's gone. So you're now sharing with somebody else and you're paying about 750 quid a month for your rent. And like literally, it's horrible uh, because getting anywhere in the city as well, like, you know, if you want to hop in your car and you want to drive to Loch Ray from Ballinasloe, that's a half hour. Yeah. And you'd happily do it because there's no traffic on the road. But if you want to go from Rat Mines uh, all the way in as far as Drumcondra, I mean, that's about 40 minutes. <laughs> no one near the distance part. Same. There's quicker ways to do it. So you obviously hop on public transport or walk. I, I, I prefer walking actually myself. But, you know, there's so many different uh, lifestyle changes. So it's like getting from A to B. It's the cost of rent. It's the cost of transport. It's the cost of food even. Like even the price of food goes up. And that's not just like you would never be eating out. Even when you're making your own lunches at home, it still goes up. And it's, it's, a, it's a big life-changing situation. Not only that, you're in working with your peers. So you're no longer... Um, you know, I, I worked very closely with the guys in iRadio. I had a lot of love for the guys in iRadio. I look at iRadio now, it's not the iRadio I worked in. It's totally different. It's a total different uh, setup, and there's a total different team there. But back in the day, you know, we were all very much so. I, I don't know what it's like now, because well, I know a couple of the broadcasters there, and they're actually lovely. And, um, and I wouldn't expect it any other way, because it is a good station. But when I was there, I know that, like, I was friends with pretty much everyone that was there on air. 
and I know that look we always had each other's back whereas when I came in here it's like you it was very strange because it was all like islands there was like you know there, this was mid morning uh, Dermot and Dave and myself worked very closely together and then you had night time as well so like myself and Paul would work closely together but when I came to daytime it was mostly myself and Dermot and Dave and this is no disrespect to the other shows it's just that they ran as machines because they have teams and we didn't have teams when we were on iRadio so like in here they have researchers producers there were six people on some teams and then with my team there's only two people so it was myself and Ed that's it and that to me was a big change because I had never worked with anyone really before. I was so used to working on my own, coming up with my own ideas. And that does kind of affect your creative process in both ways. Like some of it can kind of, you know, it pinch you a little bit because it'll kind of make you go, well, maybe that idea isn't so safe and maybe I need to be a little bit more politically correct. And you have to remember, you the audience, younger audience versus this older audience that are, you know, a little bit more conservative. you got to respect that. Because you don't want to alienate any of the listeners that were there beforehand and at the same time, you want to bring in new listeners as well. And I think that was kind of where I, I met my first barrier. And then after that, after working on that, you tend to become you tend to become at one with the audience and you get to know what they're all about. Yeah, of course, like we get people complaining about us all the time. Everyone does. I mean, you're not like Ricky Gervais put it perfectly. If everyone likes it, you're definitely doing something wrong. I mean, that's a fact. You know what I mean? You need to you need to kick up the air style time and you need to make sure that there's people out there complaining because if you don't have that, you'll never approach normality. I it's, think um Royal Nugent said that when he was commentating, uh, he was going to commentate Munster Leinster and he mm. said that if the Munster fans think that he was a blue and the Leinster fans thought he was a red, he's doing something right because oh, it means yeah. that he's somewhere in the middle and he's yeah. doing his job correctly. I mean, that is exactly what it's like. And, and no matter what, you can go on for anything. I'll give you an example there. We had a gentleman on for the quiz tonight. And the plug for the quiz is you're given a set amount of time on the clock. That time has never changed. It has never changed. I'm looking at the clock now. It's 46 seconds. It's in front of me. It has never changed. It's always been that. We've given away the 1,000 euros seven, if not eight times on the show. But this guy got nine out of nine. And I, I just, unfortunately, I was in the middle of asking him the last question when the clock went. And I looked at my producer. He said, no. You know. And I looked at him and I went, well, look. I said, you're after getting nine out of nine. I went, would you have got the last question? And I gave it to him. And he got it. said, I'm so sorry. I said, I can't give it to you, but we will send you something nice. Straight away, the text thing goes off. Uh, you shower a bastard. What are you doing? Oh, that's so mean. That's really, and you're going, well, what's the story with this? And like, it's not right. Blah, blah, blah. And give him the thousand euros. So blah, blah. And I turned around and I went, look, guys, very simple. I had an email two days ago from a lady wondering, like, you know, I thought I was giving a minute for thing. Nobody has ever said that the clock was a minute long. And yet we've given it away seven times. So it is fair. Like, I mean, in fairness, the whole idea of the quiz is that no, it's not going to be one every day. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, you like, <laughs> there has to be a challenge. There's a grand up for grabs. There has to be a challenge. But you will get it. And you get other people too as well complaining about other things like the amount of times that you use the word Jesus. It's disgraceful. Just remember some of us out here that are Catholic communities and all this. Well, there's some people out there who are, you know, who are, who are atheists, whose sons' names are Jesus and they hear it every day of the week. You know what I mean? So, I don't know. Like, you have to kind of, you weigh it up but you try to have respect for everyone. But, you know, within reason, pinch of salt. Like. Um, I will say this though, however, I never thought it, and, and like sometimes you forget it. Like I have been, there's something that happened since I came here, and I don't know what it is, but I, I feel very fortunate uh, since I got here because it has, A, given me the opportunity to interview some of the people that I've always wanted to interview. And you guys, you mentioned that you'd interviewed uh, Dave Fanning. I, I am one of Dave's biggest fans. He was the, he was the guy like who, who, you know, made the music interview big back in the day. And I met him recently along with Paul McLoon um, at a gig, David Byrne, actually in the three arena and Dave was kind of having a laugh and he goes, oh, you're the guy taking all my interviews now, you know? <laughs> and the thing is that we both talk quite quickly and we both have this kind of, you know, we both have this love for music that I hope that I never take any interviews of him because he's just so good at what he does. I didn't, but he, he remembers you and he's always a nice guy when you meet him. When we went into him, he had literally just finished interviewing Sting. Sting yeah. Apparently, yeah. Sting apparently walked past us. Yeah, Sting apparently walked past us we didn't even know studio, us. We didn't even cop it. Yeah. Like. yeah. It's, it's actually gas, but he's so good and he's so kind natured as well. He's probably one of the kindest guys that works over yeah. there <laughs> um, he was but, ready to give us a fucking tour of the place like he yeah, was, he was yeah, doing yeah. anything to make Good us feel welcome like, oh, yeah. 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 gold were we in yeah all three and gold and then we, he took us into the 2FM studio as well just, just such a good nature guy yeah. but here's the thing right I, 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 like I've been very fortunate to have met some of my heroes not only that I've been very fortunate to have some of the interviews I got but from a career perspective I would have questioned like as to whether what went on the regionals or what went on the nationals as in like when I was in the regionals I would have had a couple of nominations for awards but like, and I'm not bones, like I haven't won any gold since I got here, but every year I get nominated for three awards on the trot for something like, and I don't know what it is. Like I'll always come home with a bronze or silver or something like, I'll always have something coming home. And I, that was never the way it was. Cause like, you'd be lucky to come out with your nomination when you were in the regional. Whereas now I think, 
I've learned so much more that it's kind of like I know what they're looking for I know and like it, it, look guys you don't win the wars doesn't matter a continental fuck actually what matters is actually the amount of people that listen to your show yeah, the jail the, the big like, thing yeah. at the end of the day it doesn't matter and like I've never gone out there to, to kind of say I'm going to win awards the point I'm trying to make is that that stuff just happens that just, that, like as in those things just happen automatically once you're going in the right direction and the more like if I'm pretty sure that you'll find down the line with your podcast if you're going in the right direction it'll happen to you as well like there's podcast fairs on all the time people want to talk to you and that's a really good thing that's why you should keep this up I think it's a brilliant idea you know because you're talking getting to kind of meet with people and kind of see what they're doing what we want to do more is like networking so as you said like podcast fairs uh, just heading to places Any where kind you can chat to people yeah, and, yeah. Well, like even all of our interviews like um, you know today we're, we're here in Marconi House we're we're very privileged to be interviewing yeah. Fergal Darcy, but at the same yeah, time, it's a on the place. <laughs> as we were walking out here, it's very likely we, we could run into someone, and like it's even just the opportunities like that that you know. But that's important. Like, and always, I always say this. Like, you know, it, it, there's a lot to be said about. I, I know that when I come into the job first, I was one of the pieces of advice I was given, and it always works. And I like, and I don't want anyone to take this the wrong way, but there's a lot to be said about a little bit of humility, and I don't mean that as in like just be a little bit humble, like, mm-hmm. and and, and I, like I don't expect that for, for me, but like I expect the likes of Ian Dempsey who's been here for twenty years, or Matt Cooper who you've listened to, and you know it's always nice to say hello to them and have manners, not to kind of meet them, go, hey, you, you the man from the radio, like, <laughs> you, know, you, you, you fucker, like you know they don't, nobody wants to hear that. Like at the end of the day, I remember Dermot Whelan walked out the door one day, and along comes the Viking tours. Hey! Hey, the roar and everything a whole lot and there's Dermot Whelan walking out and they go there's your man there's your man that used to be on Republic of Telly I think he's selling fridges now <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, this, this is the kind of shit that happens like yeah. uh, but I, I find it the whole time like I always find this like we get spotted at gigs the whole time myself and Ed we go, we go to a lot of gigs because like our, we, our whole focus at the moment on the show is music and it's music intensive show it's not like what I was doing it's not a magazine show like what I was doing on my radio or at night from 7 to 9 but since I went to kind of 2 to half 4 that's what it is uh, but at gigs we get spotted the whole time I will always make that effort and I, mm. I see Joe Cooney doing it uh, or sorry Joe Canning doing it when he comes off the pitch he'll sign every autograph for everything yeah. and like I'm so grateful for people to tune into the show that literally I would make sure I made the time it was a no brainer when you guys asked to come down here like I was kind of going well, look if I can help you out no problem you might say it to one of your friends like you know he's actually alright or he's a prick either way I'll get five <laughs> more listeners <laughs> but, uh, I don't know how that's going to work but you know you know, I'd, I'd like to think that you know that I could help you again or somewhere like that or maybe you might help me, help me if I'm doing some research or something again but I, that's, and that's what it's all about help each other like it's a very small industry like. yeah very good uh, one thing I wanted to touch on is obviously you did take over from the late and great uh, Tony Fenton yeah. was that uh, a big weight on your shoulders going into it big shoes to fill like big it, issues, it, it, just, it just the circumstances like it just obviously the circumstances of him passing away that, that might have probably added to, to it yeah it was well. weird I, I have to tell you it's weird because I know that a lot of time even in my early career people would compare and they would say that, you know, his voice sounds kind of like Tony Fenton at times. And, and I can hear it at times and other times I can't hear it. But like, there is, the other time I'll be, there is something inside you that when you're introducing a song, you go, it's 100 to 102 today, FM, if you want to get in contact today. Oh, it's 74 100 102. And you'll say it, and then you can listen back to that or you can listen to Tony going, hey, it's Tony here. And oh, it's 74. But like, there, you can, there's certain phrases that we have, call signs that we might choose that are similar. I don't know. Um, the one thing I would say about it is I didn't directly take over from Tony. Uh, uh, Louise was in instead of Tony for a while and then they, there was a swap up and I know that like when I went in it was always I, I know that it had always been sold to me look it's like for like um, and like I know that at the time too as well I think Louise had some other project on and it suited her to move and like she has God, she's killing seven to nine at the moment. She's doing a great job there. And and similarly like you know I've managed to do my job here. My task was to get it over 100,000 again which I did. Um, I think it was daunting because you have to remember that when that show was losing figures as well, and this is with the height of respect to Tony Fenton, I we'd only started on my radio and pretty much I was on the same time as Tony. So obviously I was taking some of his figures as well and he was taking some of my figures. So there was always that kind of connection there. I met him once or twice. Um, I would never have worked with him, worked with him here, but I met him once or twice and I, can, I just say this, that he was one of the nicest, most charismatic gentlemen I've ever met in the industry. And it's weird because when I started working here, we'd listen back to audio and listen to him telling stories and I'd listen to some of the songs and we had quite a lot in common like that. Uh, another thing which was kind of a personal thing and not many people know this, but I'll tell you since you're here, um, people used to always talk about Tony and they'd always have these great stories about Tony and at one stage, it kind of got a bit strange for me because my own father's name is Tony and he passed away when I was a kid. And, you know, they'd always be talking about, you know, Tony this and Tony that and can't believe Tony's dead. And in my head, I'd be kind of going, 
is this some sort of fucking joke? Like, you know, because like in your head, you kind of keep hearing the same thing over and over again. Oh, Tony this and Tony that. And it's like, it does, it resonated with me a little bit. Now look, come here. Was it, I'm not, you know what I mean? I'm a grown ass man, like, but it's when those, those things do happen to you when you, like, when you get a little bit older. I know when you're in your 30s, you start to think about those things like, you know, I was, I was 14, 15 when my dad died. Like, in fairness, like, I didn't really take the time out to grieve. Like, I kind of just did the whole, like, grow up and be the man in the house kind of thing, because I was the only man in the house. And, um, and so got a job, that kind of thing. And, you know, there's often times in my life where, like, there's certain occasions I've had in my life where I didn't have a dad to go to. And there's been, like, you know, I crashed my car, couldn't tell my mom because she'd freak out and she'd never want me driving the fucking car. So, like, literally, I had to solve that problem myself. And I, I hated it. I hated that period of my life. And and that was like that was during the period I was in Claire FM as well. So it was kind of a lot of things happened that time. You know, you'd be going through a breakup and then you'd have all this thing with the car and not having your dad around and having people in the job that you know probably didn't really want you in the job and you not wanting to be in the job, not knowing where your life was going. And you pick yourself up all out of that stuff and you come up and it's just there's certain things that you hold on to and like there's certain uh, terms or buzz phrases you often hear about this is transfer of emotion. But when you hear someone telling stories about Tony and what, I, what always struck me is that there was there came a time where I didn't hate it so much because they would tell these stories about Tony and how Tony used to love to bring the gang up and you know he'd come out and he'd pour out a couple of shots of tequila and he'd bring it up in the balcony where having the parties upstairs in the garden which you were sitting at when I met you yeah. and they were like oh, yeah, 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 yeah. and the boys would bring them out and they're like oh Tony you shouldn't have because oh, it's just a little drink like you know and they have a drink my dad would have been the same guy and you know and I used to love those stories so I think there's kind of a, a beautiful serendipity if you want in it mm, very good because you start thinking about those things it's like I, I think. I know that this is going to sound so fucking flowery, but I think that faith put me here. And, uh, you know, I used to always hear this phrase, you know, Tony's looking down on you. And like, I'd always, whenever anyone would say that to me from that was working here, they'd say, well, Tony's looking down on you, you're doing good work there, kids. And particularly Colin O'Sullivan used to say it and Ed, Ed Smith, uh, because they both worked very closely with Tony for years. I would always think, He's not the only Tony, and yeah, I think that that kind of that, yeah, that, that drove me on. And I, I like it, lads. It's not a bad it, like by any means. It's like it just drove me kind of on. And I think that that's that was kind of one of the things. I do think that he will never be replaced. He's one of the great influences of Irish broadcasters, and I just think that like you know, as long as you can listen back to his old audio, and thank God we all have that still, because mm. he's just one of those beautiful presenters. Great turn of phrase, great taste in music, and he came from a time when you could pick the music. It wasn't all playlisted on you, you know. Um, for I have one thing while I was doing my research and something you kind of touched on there Catholicism and stuff it was one of my favourite quotes and the lads actually hadn't heard the expression before but an a la carte Catholic yeah 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 I think yeah I think I we are yeah yeah, yeah um, the expression how, I did my thesis on the relationship oh god here we go <laughs> journalist <laughs> back of the flesh right give me a minute whilst I click this pen into the microphone and answer a question um, so I did my thesis on the relationship between the Roman Catholic Church and religious affairs correspondence at the height of clerical sexual abuse and I think it's still in the DIT library um, the funny thing about it is that term a la carte Catholic was something that I kept on coming across and it, it is a very true term. The term a la carte Catholic means that we're Catholics when we want to be. Yep. We'll go to christenings, we'll go to weddings, we'll go to funerals. We don't go to mass on Sunday anymore. Go hear that. Yeah. Oh. You know what I, do you know who? I love Better good mass. I know. Hey, Come Mary, on now. Paul of Grace, the Lord. <laughs> 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 do you know, like, literally, we've all gone through it, but yeah. yeah. I love a good old midnight mass and a few pints afterwards. You know, <laughs> you know they cancelled midnight mass yeah. in my local parish because everyone used to just go up and get absolutely steamed in the pub beforehand, go up to mass and stumble back down to Three the pub. Drinks. <laughs> yeah. 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 So uh, they yeah. had to cancel it. Uh, so, yeah. Fergal, what's next? What's in the future? Well, I mean, um, you recently started uh, an another show. On to, today, yeah. XM. So there's a couple. Well, there's a couple. Of, there's a couple of projects in the pipeline. Um, I I 100 want to do something music related in television or documentary making, and I, I do think that's something that I, I've been toying around with. I'm actually um, looking at at the moment. There's also you see, there's a lot of interest from different parties. Like I do a lot of um, acting as well, and professional acting. So I have that. Like that's just another thing for me. So I mean, where did that come from, actually? Well, I, I have a background in that. Like okay. so, literally, my background. I would have been acting years before I ever went in, and then like I was approached because they knew that I was into that kind of stuff, and ended up doing spam a lot professionally and a couple of things like that, pantos and things like that. Like there's no harm in any of that stuff. I think that there, there will definitely be more shows down the line. I definitely want to do a bit of television. Uh, music wise and show wise, I'm I'm quite happy where I am at the moment, but I want to do, uh, I, I want it a lot more intensive and I want a lot more of me reflected in the music. I, I do think that we need to regard that boundary. I think that that's something that we need to look more at in Ireland. You know, we live in an age of stream and Spotify, things like that. It's by size communication. I mean, most consumers, they will only stay with you for four or five minutes, which means that my job anymore is not doing 10 minute interviews with Will Smith. If he's on Capital in London, he'll get 
three minutes. And the reason why he gets three minutes is that that's all the listeners have the span for. Like, if you put on a, a 10 minute interview, they're like, oh, Jesus, come <laughs> on. Like, was he ever going to stop? Like, you know, so like literally you have to kind of live in that bite-sized community. As regards for podcasting online, I'm, I'm working on a new podcast, which is a foodie podcast called Recipes for Disaster. But I do think, like, I, I've become very at home here today, FM, and I have become part of the family. It took me a while to get there um, because it is different for me than a lot of the people here. I know I know that some of the guys here would have came from regional to national. But for me, like, you have to remember, I came from documentary making to local to regional to national. And I went from being a journalist to being a broadcaster. And I mean, there isn't that much of a difference when you look at it, but it's just how you do that. I would definitely think that, you know, over the next year or two, I'm definitely going to be grafting harder to get achieve my own goals because I, I, I get tired. You know what I mean? I could get tired. I wouldn't rule out working across the water either. Really? Yeah, I wouldn't work, I'd rule it out. I, I know that I'm adventurous and I know that there's always part of me that kind of wants to be, you know, you can only go as far in certain spots, but you need to realise, you know, when it's time to move on. Uh, you need to realise, you know, if you're not getting what you want or you're not fulfilling your quota or you feel that something is wrong, you need to have that job satisfaction. The best bit of advice I can give you is, you know, review your life every couple of years. Make sure that you're happy in your job because if you like your job, you'll never work a day in your life. That's certainly something that you've already showed within your career from that, like you said, that move from Claire Toy Radio and yeah. taking whatever was the foreground less just because you wanted that, yeah, that I, change I, up. Do you know, I, I would 100% support that all the time. I just think that, you know, there's some things that are more important in life. And do you know, I've met a lot of people along my way and I've watched them, you know, leaving jobs in radio and taking up something else. I met Jonathan Healy the other day from News Talk, lovely guy. And literally he's doing his own PR thing now and he's doing a podcast at Red FM and he is so happy. He is so happy. Like there's other people as well, like another friend of mine, Colin Sullivan, former uh, program director here, one of the guys who hired me here. Um, he was one of the, like he has won more PPIs than anyone I know for his show transmission on Red many years ago. And like literally he was working here for years and, you know, had a baby and just wanted to change his life up a bit. Now he's doing consultancy in radio. He's a full-time dad as well. He's just like just doing this great work and marketing as well. And he's just so happy. But sometimes, you know, there, there's more to life, you know. And like some people might like view it like going from today FM maybe to something else like as a step down but it's certainly not I mean if you look at the likes of like Ray Foley he had a, a like a very popular show here and now he's yeah. down in I went to 98 and now he's in Cork and now he's in Cork, Cork yeah if you approach it this way right Ray Foley this year um, Ray Foley won gold as music broadcaster I won silver that's it and like I, I have the height of respect for Ray yeah. like Ray went through a, a bit of a time there came around full circle like and a nice guy you know at the end of it all too um I gotta say this, like there is, like there is, it, it is just like that, you know. It it, it 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 depends on where you're going to find yourself happy, and I mean, I do think at the moment, like it is borderline impossible to maintain living in Dublin. So I could see myself moving outside of Dublin, but that might open windows of opportunity for me to do something else. I would love to do something countrywide, and I definitely would love to do more charity work because I think that's one thing that our show became known for when we're doing yeah. Dare to Care was the charity stuff, and I think that that's like something that I've always been passionate about, and I think that like. I, Jesus Christ I, I, I don't know what it is I think it's there's a karma there that goes full circle that if you can show someone that you actually care or you give a fuck they will actually tend to say well you know fair play and you're doing it for the right reasons and th- like you cannot the reward that you get in, in your karma and emotionally from doing something good or raising money for charity because you know that you're an influential person on the radio and you are the fact that you're over there is means you're influential use your influence to the right things and I'll tell you this much you feel so good about it it's not a power thing it's like literally you feel like you've actually helped someone and definitely, you know what you can sit definitely. down for the next week then yeah. fundraising uh, is something where we've seen a lot of uh, with the media production society you have in DCU yeah. we do the 24 hour broadcast every December yes yeah, so, yeah. yeah. so basically we're up for 24 hours uh, we're wrecked by the end of it but making content you know once we we're a bit delirious goal, we're yeah. probably not ourselves but we um, have fun doing it and at the end of the day like and you see, like, the utter, like, I mean, our target this year was seven grand and the utter joy everybody had, like, there was tears filling the room yeah. when we passed seven grand. I think I gave this a mention on the radio last yeah, year. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, It's a we, brilliant idea. We went on and hit, I think it was nine grand. Nine, yeah. End, and then and I think everybody. by the time the sponsorship came into it and stuff, I think uh, I think it was ten. I know, it was, we hit eight and then by when oh, sponsorship sorry, came yeah, in, we yeah, hit nine. Yeah. But yeah, like, everybody was just deliriously happy with, with ourselves because we knew that we did it for a, a great cause. And even Gavin and I did uh, Beg, Borrow, Steel last year, so it's quite similar to the Trinity Jailbreak, if you're yeah, familiar yeah, with yeah, it. Yeah. So it's just basically the DCU version of it. Um, so we had to depend on completely on the generosity of others, and we got from Dublin to London to Amsterdam, Amsterdam to Barcelona. I think that's pretty cool. Without yeah, spending yeah. a penny ourselves. And all the while, we were promoting uh, Movember, the men's health charity, yeah. And anybody that listened to us, whether it was 30 seconds or five minutes, 
we were going to inform them as best we could. Mm. And by the time we got to Barcelona, we got ourselves a little ice cream. Well, we had a bit of a nightmare, but by the time we got there, <laughs> we sat out in the sun, got a bit of a sunburn and ate 99s while overlooking La Rambla. It meant all Rambla. Our files. I love that, Jay. And then they were sick of each other by the time they came back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, listen, cups off, boys. Listen, you, uh, we're coming into, we, I know that I have to Louise in here to um, do pre records. So, is Anthony, you want to ask like any uh, mad questions you want to ask? Anthony at all? Um, we'll just it. do a few quick for us to, to finish us off. Go. Perfect. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Ooh, how do you like your coffee? Strong. Strong. Okay. I'm You're black, American like kind of guy, or you latte, a bit of milk. In it. Probably get in trouble for making that comment, won't I? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm just kind of an Americano kind of guy with a drop of milk. Okay. Okay. Um, three people you invite to a dinner party. Three people I invite to a dead or alive. dinner party. Dead or alive. Ooh, the celestial band. That's a good one. Uh, <laughs> Freddie Mercury, David Bowie, and uh, who else would I bring? Freddie Mercury, David Bowie, and uh, Keith Moon. Yeah. Um, nice. Speaking of music. Favourite artist, past and present? Favourite artist, past and present. At this moment in time, uh, I 100%. Do you know, I'm actually, I'm back digging Tom York Radiohead uh, totally again uh, since the I've just, I, I've always loved that vibe, yeah. but even when I was younger. Um, past, I was a huge Green Day fan back in the day, yeah. When Nimrod and all that was out, yeah. And Dookie, they would have been two favourites of mine when I was in secondary school. Right, and the last question we'll ask is, you walk out Marconi, Marconi House this evening and you have the power to do anything you want. Any band you want to see, any place you want to go for uh, a meal or whatever, you can choose your Everything perfect Everything is evening. within your control. What are you doing? I would collect my girlfriend, I would get a taxi, I would go straight out to the Gravediggers in Glasnevin and sit down with my on and enjoy just one pint of Guinness. There and that's go. it, because there is no televisions, there is no bank machines, there is no mess and no music, no nothing. It's just literally just silence and people chatting amongst themselves and it's just a beautiful place. There's a bit of romance about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. There is, there's a certain romance about that, you know what I mean? I might even just go out with my own actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, that's a lovely, succinct end to the show. Fergal, thanks an, an absolute million for Listen, uh, come here, hey. inviting us out here. Guys been a pleasure and Anthony has you for in the future if there's anything else you want or need anyway let me know um, even if there's you're questions you're going to regret saying that so no, much no 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 <laughs> fuck it like seriously seriously like seriously like you know what I mean you're very good to think of me and if there's anything you need let me know as I said yeah we're all a team like this has been In Conversation with Fergal Darcy thank you very much for listening and Slot and Gafold yeah points yeah, yeah. <laughs>